Hi, this is Mark Summers, and today I'm going to be talking to the great Greg Louganis. We're going to discuss life with HIV. But at that time, in 1988, I mean, there wasn't a whole... I mean, people thought you were getting it from toilet seats, yep. and you know, it was knew. crazy. The value of meditation... I, I, I just uh, been doing this meditation, or hypnosis, for confidence. And surviving failures. So my sole purpose on this planet was to prevent Klaus from winning that gold medal. And I failed. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Mark Summers Unwraps. The camera doesn't lie, so I think you have to be authentic. And if you pretend to be somebody you're not, I think the longevity in this industry is probably slim and none. There are performance artists. The first one that comes to my mind is because I went to school with him is Andy Kaufman. Um, you either love that type of stuff or you don't. I'm not a huge fan of it. I don't get it, quite honestly. Uh, Andy and I kind of never saw eye to eye, and I could tell you endless stories about uh, sort of button heads. Um, and so that's to me, is inauthentic, although you could say that Pee Wee Herman did a similar thing, and yet that was a much more likable character than the craziness that Andy, in my opinion, tried to pull off. So I think being who you are um, is key, but it's easier said than done. Being who you are um, sometimes scares the hell out of people, and they don't want others to find out who that real person is. So um, I think it probably takes years to become your true self. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Mark Summers Unwraps. My guest today is Greg Louganis. I'm so excited that you are here for so many reasons. I'm of the proper age when people used to watch the Olympics <laughs> on television and everybody would stop. Yeah. Uh, I'm 10 years older than you, so I know oh, okay. exactly your history, I thought. Okay. You thought. So okay. here's the deal. The reason we started this podcast, and I, I was approached by many people and, and kept saying no. And this is all about when you watch somebody either on a Broadway stage or in a movie or a TV show or an Olympic champion, you say, boy, those people are so lucky. And what you don't realize is how hard it is to get from point A to point B. Right. People just assume way too much. Yeah. So I knew a lot of your story. And yeah. my question was going to be, my God. You know, I, I was doing Danny Bonaducci's radio show 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he brought up the two things that I'm known for, a, a kid's game show on Nickelodeon and having obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah. And I said... For the love of God, when do I get to stop talking about this? And he said, when people stop asking me about the Partridge family. Okay, so I yeah. kind of get that. Right. And I thought to myself, how many times is Greg going to have to tell this story to the point where he just doesn't want to do it anymore? And I thought and I thought, and we have a mutual friend, uh, Glenn Scarpelli. Oh, Glenn. And loves, I love Glenn. I love Glenn. Yeah. And I called Glenn and I said, here's the direction that I want to go. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? And he said, oh, you don't know the real story. And I said, okay. tell me a little bit about the real story. Yeah. And he led me down a path. And so that's the direction I'm going to guide this. But you were nice enough okay. to say before we roll tape here today that uh, you were willing to go in any direction. Sure. All yeah. right. Yeah. How would you describe your life up to this point? Those of us in the public eye got here, whether we wanted to get here or not, somehow we got here. Okay. Yeah. Yours is an amazing story because people have not accomplished, nobody else has accomplished what you have done in the diving world. Right. But is that the most important thing that you want people to take away? No, no, no. I mean, I, I, okay, so I wrote my book, Breaking the Surface. Mm -hmm. That was published in 1995. Not a whole lot of people were out about their HIV status and, and all that. Um, I, you know, I felt that that was like my, diving gave me a platform. No pun intended. Pun, pun intended, <laughs> yes. right? Uh, it gave me a platform to have a voice. And so in using that voice, um, in 1995, I was able to to share my HIV status and, and what I went through because I was diagnosed HIV positive six months prior to the Olympic Games in 1988. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, sharing that, uh, that was really about letting go of secrets. Um, and I kept thinking in the process, you know, the truth shall set you free. And so it was, that was, that was the gist of it. But then, um, 
Initially, I did it for myself, you know, to free myself. But when I was on book tour and I had these thousands and thousands of people showing up and to sign their book and say, you saved my life. You know, that was so impactful to me. I was like, oh my God. You, you know? had no idea. I had no idea. I had no idea. And some of them, it was, oh, I came out about my uh, sexuality to my friends and family through your book, or I came out about my HIV status, or I left a, an abusive relationship. You gave me the courage to leave an abusive relationship. There were so many things that people were sharing with me on the book tour that that was... The most important thing you ever did in your life. Yeah. And and so let's step back for a second. Didn't you s s sort of... Uh, I, gee, I have so many things I want to talk So Glenn Scarpelli <laughs> said to me, the question is, or the, the story is, mm -hmm. that you were outed by somebody else. You didn't have the choice to out yourself. Is that a true statement? Oh, okay. Uh, um, ba, 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 ba. Is that a... Well, yeah. it, it, it depends on the perspective that you're you're looking at in the time frame. Okay. Well, let's go back. So you're diving. Okay. You hit your head on a on a diving board. Yeah. You're now bleeding into the water. Well, you know, that's one of the things that uh, when you have an injury like that, it mm -hmm. doesn't bleed right away. You did not. No. I didn't bleed in the pool. She every because thing it, I read said that you I know, I know, I know. Wow. I, 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 I I you know what I don't read my press. Probably smart. I don't read my press, and so they're they're going to say what they're going to say, you know, and make assumptions that they're going to make assumptions. Um, and so, yeah, when you have an injury like that, think about it. It doesn't bleed right away. No. And all of a sudden, that's in everything that you read. Right. And it supposedly frightened everybody because nobody uh, was aware of what HIV was at the time. And right. And so that became. Well, kind I was, of a non-story. I, I, I was also in a country that had they known my HIV status, I wouldn't have been allowed because there was a travel ban. I didn't know that. Is yeah, it Korea? Yeah, Korea. Oh, yeah, no yeah. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't have been able to compete at that Olympic Games. Oh, my. But um, anyways, uh, yeah. So the whole blood in the pool and all that, that you know, that's, that, that's like a crazy, it's very dramatic. But not sure, true. but it's not true. Oh my! No, the the only people that were right were in um, potential harm's way would have been the doctors, uh, Dr. James Puffer and Ben Rubin, um, because they uh, direct contact with the blood, mm -hmm. uh, and my coach. Um, so you know th that was the only you know, real concern. But at that time in 1988, I mean, there wasn't a whole. I mean, people thought you were getting it from toilet seats yep. and you know, it was knew. crazy. I always tell the story. One of my dearest friends uh, was diagnosed very early Yeah, and uh, was moving back uh, to New England mm -hmm. and I was helping him move and he was drinking a can of soda and he said, oh, I got to get my keys and he handed me the soda and I thought to myself, oh my God, what have I done? That's how ignorant we were back then. Right. The facts were not out. Right. Thank God they are now. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, I think the the frightened, uh, you know, human uh, psyche of what is this thing, and can I right. get it by just you know touching you or being near right. you or God knows what. Well, you know what? I, I was doing a play um, in, uh, in in the desert, uh, and um, um, little dog laughed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Don Lewis and Brian Normoyal, and <clears throat> opposite, you know, Brian. And we had a scene where we were kissing. And like uh, the first night with, with an audience, you know, I was like shaving really quick and it's like cut my lip. I'm like, I was, I was freaking out. Really? <clears throat> yeah. I was like, what do we do? What do we do? Because oh I wanted to protect him. Yeah. And, you know, um, we didn't know at that time, undetectable, un, un, um, undetectable, then you can't transmit, un, untransmittable. Mm -hmm. um, so it was before that time. And I was just, I mean, I was so upset, tears and everything. And then we re-choreographed the whole scene. 
And, uh, and actually the director said, you know what? That was even more sensual. Keep it. Yeah. Wow. Well, we, we didn't keep it. No. No. Um, but it was, yeah, he said that it, it just added a certain... Another layer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that was really interesting. But um, yeah, I mean, there, you know, there's an awareness that you have and you want to be protective um, but there's also that, uh, that line that is more kind of the alarmist, you know, and, um. Tell me about the Barbara Walters interview. The Barbara Walters interview? Mm -hmm. You know what? That was, I, she sounded really tough on me in the interview because I, I, I watched that, but, um, she was a lovely, lovely person. You know, I when I showed up to do the interview um, the night before, I found out that my therapist passed, and I was, you know, I, I was pretty shaken up. Mm. And she knew something was wrong. She said, "Greg, what's going on?" I said, "Well, my my therapist just died." And she goes, "Oh my god!" And she just wrapped me in her arms and said, "You know, we'll get through this together." She had a way. She did. Yeah, I, I was on The View for many years, and I did get an interview uh, by her. Yeah. And uh, as tough as she could be, yeah. uh, off camera, and actually on camera as well, she had a big heart. Yeah. Massive heart. Yeah. And I think just wanted to do the best interview possible as opposed to expose people. Right. Which is kind of the... The, the train of thought now. Okay, yeah. we've jumped all over the place. Now I want to <laughs> step back. We've kind of we've kind of uh, hit the bullseye really quick here. But um, let's talk about your background. Um, okay. Adopted. Adopted. Uh, found out that you're what part Samoan and what else? Uh, my biological father's Samoan, and then my uh, biological mother's Northern European, so Irish, Welsh. Swedish, Danish. Wow. I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. And what an age ex... were you adopted? Mm. I spent my first nine months in foster care. Mm. And then um, fortunately, because at that time, I mean, they, you know, couples wanted blonde hair, blue eyed babies. Always. <laughs> you know? So, um, and my mother, she's Scotch Irish, uh, my father's Greek. So my mother wanted babies to reflect my dad. Ah. So, you know, darker hair and uh, olive complexion. Um, yeah, so fortunately, they found me. Fortunately, but, in many ways. Yeah, um, many ways. So I know you as a diver until yeah. I got into a deep dive in your life. Yeah. And you were doing acrobatics and, and doing things long before you got into the diving world. Talk yeah, to me about yeah, that. Yeah. So I, I started doing dance and acrobatics when I was a year and a half. Because my sister was taking lessons, and they gave me a coloring book, and I couldn't stay in the lines of the coloring book, so <laughs> and it was boring, <laughs> and so I'd crawl under the seats and sneak into the studio and imitate what they were doing. And so when I was a year and a half, the teacher said, "Oh, let him stay. We'll see what we can teach him." And um, I, my first performance on stage was when I was three. I sang Dance With Me and did a little tap number. Oh, my. And I had top hat and tails and, and, and all that. My mother made the costume. And, um, and then I got a partner shortly after that. And we couldn't compete in talent contests until I turned six. Oh, my. She was a year older than me. So when I turned six, then we could start competing. And once we started competing, you know, we did recitals, uh, we did parades, you know, all of these things, fairs, um, that, you know, once we started competing, we start, we were winning everything. Oh. I mean, we even, when I was uh, 11 or 12 years old, we won the sweepstakes at this huge talent contest in San Diego. And, um, and you loved performing. I, yeah, I loved performing. So that well, I I I also I also didn't speak. What? I when I was a kid, I didn't speak. Explain that. Well, I had an older sister who had finished my sentences for me. Um, I was very. Uh, I'm dyslexic, so I didn't know about dyslexia until I was in college. Okay. I was given dys dyslexia as a vocabulary word in my college English class. Like, oh my god, I'm not stupid and retarded and all these things that they used to call me, I'm dyslexic. Um, but 
I didn't, I, I, I didn't speak. I didn't have to. And, and that's what I loved about dance and diving and d- dance and acrobatics is because I could use my body to express my feelings and all that stuff. So um, I didn't have to use words. So when I started school, I didn't realize I stuttered. So, and I, I didn't know. And so I was in speech therapy. Um, so yeah, so I didn't, I didn't speak a whole lot when I was a kid. So you were overcoming obstacles at an early age. Yeah. How did the transition from acrobatics and dancing and singing happen to diving? <clears throat> when I was, you know, 11, 12, I, I, I had Osney Slaughters, which is pretty common for yep. an active young kid, physically active young kid. And so my doctor said that you have to quit the dance and the acrobatics and gymnastics, but you can continue diving because you are landing in water. And so that's when all of that energy that was in all of these other disciplines was focused onto one discipline. How old were you here? I was 13. No, I was 12. 12. I was 12. And did you enjoy diving as much as you did the other performing? No. Not as, not as much. Um, because I mean, uh, when you're dancing and you have an audience, you know, you instant have gratification. that instant gratification, right. Um, and gymnastics, I, I felt that that was kind of an extension. You just add the judges and scores. Um, but, uh, yeah, diving was, yeah, diving was okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but you know, all of that energy focused on to one discipline in, you know, one year uh, at age 13, I was world champion for my age group. And then th- three years after that, I was on my first Olympic team. You were at 16? 16, yeah. And where was uh, Montreal? Montreal. I was just up there. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. It's quite an uh, interesting place. So you're 16 yeah. and you get, what, a, a silver medal? Silver. Yeah. And so you decided to pursue it. Well, I... Um, Diving was just something that I was good at. You know, I, another thing about silver medal is um, the highest rate of suicide amongst Olympians is Olympic silver medalists. Really? Because yeah. they do all that hard work and then... Well, if you think about it, it makes sense. So when you win, it, that's what it's expected. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're second, you know, that's the first loser. If you're third, hmm. chances are you're just grateful to have something mm-hmm. to bring home. I had no so, idea that statistic even existed. Yeah, My yeah. goodness. So you're 16, mm-hmm. you win your first medal, mm-hmm. and you know in four years you could qualify again. Did you have any idea where this was leading? Well, I knew that it was a way for to college, hmm. you know, because in diving, I, you know, I, I could get a scholarship and I could go to school. That was my education. So... Um, yeah, so that's, you know, it, it served, you know, a higher purpose. Um, but you, you were a theater major, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. So you kept that going. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, uh, drama, I was in the BF, BFA program at University of Miami for my first two years. Then you transferred. And then I transferred to UC Irvine, graduated there with a bachelor's in drama, minor in dance. And so was uh, diving just something to do? Or were you um, passionate about it? Well, it it, it, it took uh, it, it took took a lot of different hats, basically. You know, uh, it, it initially it was like something I was good at, and it was providing me with uh, certain things: college education, travel, um, you know, some nice nice perks. Uh, It wasn't until I started diving with Ron O'Brien and he saw something in me and he was the one who really kind of um, tore down all the walls because from my beginnings, I mean, adopted, didn't speak. There were so many things to get to who this person is, Greg Luganis. And he was just taking down walls, you know, building trust. And that's the reason why we were able to dominate the sport of diving for 10 years. And you you truly did. And yeah, we did. I mean, we were an incredible team. Um, And I couldn't have done it without him because he kept me motivated. He kept me 
Uh, he knew that I was a performer and not a competitor. Um, and so he tapped into that. Uh, one, of, one of the games that we used to play uh, in training was the 700 game. What's that? Um, on 10 meter platform, to, for me to break 700, which was a huge point barrier, uh, 700 on 10 meter platform, I had to average eight and a halves or better on all 10 dives. I was watching lots of video video on you the last couple of days. You do that on a consistent basis. <laughs> well, that but you know, it, and and we made a game out of it. But you made it look effortless. You know, when I watch that stuff, yeah. And I know how hard it is, and how many hours of practice, excuse me, or rehearsal, <laughs> if you can look at it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just never seemed like it was work to you. It just seemed mm. natural. But that's the trick, right? Yeah. You know, because you as a performer understand that you have to make something very difficult look look effortless. Yeah. Never let them see you sweat. Right. Really comes through in something like that. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I watched 15 minutes last night of you getting all those 8.5s and higher. Um, Here's the thing I noticed, though, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. You were excited when you won. But I never saw a, oh, my God, this is the coolest thing ever feeling. Am I wrong? Um, There was hugging and pats on the back. Okay, so um, probably the closest that I had been to that would have been 1982 World Championships, three-meter springboard. Um. I, I have a few moments like that mm-hmm. in that decade of dominance, right? Um, so 1982, World Championships, Guayaquil, Ecuador. Uh, I remember we were being introduced because we go reverse order of finish from the prelims and semis. Um, so I won, so I was going last. And then Alexander Portinoff w- was just before me. So he was second to last. And I remember as we were being introduced to the audience, you know, uh, he was introduced, Alexander Portinoff from the USSR, um, the, from the Soviet Union, uh, Olympic gold medalist, 1980. And then I'm introduced, Greg Luganis, United States of America, Olympic silver medalist, 1976. Mm. And I thought to myself, it's like, I looked over at Alexander, I was like, thinking in my head, you won because I wasn't there. <laughs> and so I felt like I had a point to, to make. Yeah, yeah I, I, I had to prove myself. I always wanted my performance to speak for itself. I didn't want to have to use words to speak for myself. And so uh, we we're going through the competition, comes down to the last dive. I look up at the scoreboard <clears throat> to make sure that they have the correct dive number. And I see my score flashing on the board. And I realized, oh my God, I already won. So I, you I didn't have to do my last dive. Really? I mean, I think it's still the highest uh, point spread that anybody's won any world or Olympic competition. So you must have been so at ease. That was, and, and that, there, there was joy in that. Had to be. Experience. Um, 1984, the men's 10 meter platform I felt like that was that was a dream come true competition for me on ten meter platform. Uh, I kept I, Ron O'Brien kept telling me keep just keep dancing, just keep dancing, <laughs> just keep dancing, uh, and it was just like and we were. I mean, it, it was so uh, the connection was so incredible, and it did it did feel like a dance, and I broke seven hundred. I mean, I know, you know, I got to my inward three and a half and I was thinking, okay, if I can get through this one, you know, then chances are good. I got this. And then I, and then there's that fear of, there's this fear of success. What if I do it? What's next? And that- Wait a minute, wait a minute. Fear of success. Yeah. Explain that. Well, what do you have to look forward to after that? You know, if you if you achieve your goal, then then there's a fear. It's like okay, the next, and you were really young. 
Well, I was 24. Yeah. That was really young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, and, and also the fear of failure. What if I get so close and I never get there again? You know, so all so this is going through your this, head? Through the, you know, various times in the competition, because your mind races. Your mind's racing with thoughts and ideas and scenarios that, you know, you're making what up. Ifs. What ifs, yeah, right. Um, but ultimately, you know, with each dive, and, and this is something I learned, mm -hmm. you know, in peak performance, you know, you, you gotta let all that shit go. Not easy. You gotta, you gotta allow your body to do what it was trained to do and trust it. You know, and be aware, because if you're thinking, it's like, oh my God, I did this. You're you can judging. think yourself right you can out of think, it. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. But you were so flexible. You were like Gumby <clears throat> to me when I watched you on those things. Yeah. You were in such great shape yeah. that once again, you did make it look effortless. Yeah, okay. All right, so let's take a step back from where we are now, because we're going to okay. come back to it. When did you realize that you were gay? What age? You know, I always knew that I was different. I didn't. I didn't put sexuality to it. Mm. And also, I mean, the kids, I'm sure, saw it in me because I was called fag and really? sissy boy and all that stuff. Now, what do you think brought up. that on? Were um, you feminine in any way back when you were diving or prob acting? Probably. Probably, huh? Yeah, probably. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I mean, and also, I mean, I was in dance and acrobatics. Mm. It's not exactly... Yeah, the most you know, masculine thing. Yeah, yeah. So now you go and win uh, how, many, how many medals at the... Uh, a Korean Olympics? Yeah, five? Well, okay, so um, silver medal in 76, Montreal, my yeah. first Olympics. I did uh, I did make the finals in the three-meter springboard as well because I won the Olympic trials um, in 76. Won the Olympic trials in 80, but we didn't go. Yep. Um, and then won the Olympic trials in 84. We only had two events at that time, so three-meter springboard, 10-meter platform. Um, so two golds in 84, and then I repeated that in 88. So you walk away and mm -hmm. one would think, yeah. wow, so successful. You know, I, I, I always go to Mark Spitz, you know, everybody thought yeah. he was going to be a movie star and yeah. all this stuff. What happened for you after those momentous occasions? Well, um... You know, it, it, yeah, I, I, I was, I, there was a lot going on. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was in an, in an abusive relationship and I was just trying to get out of that. With your manager? He was my, yeah, yeah. my manager slash partner. Older was, than you? Um, not much. Not so much abusive older. in what way? I mean, physical, he, he mental? He raped me. Oh, he did. He raped me in the first year of our relationship. Oh my. Um, and... I stayed. You know, my therapist said, "Well, what what was your part in it?" I said, "I'm what a the victim." Hell kind of I'm a victim. It's like, you know, but then I thought about it. I was like, "You know what? Yeah, you know, I I stayed. I mean, I that's 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 my thought. I mean, I had no self-esteem." Hmm. So, and And so once he realized that that was allowed, it probably only got worse, didn't it? Well, it it, it was just verbal after that. Okay. You know, rarely did it turn too physical. How long did that relationship last? Um, I, w I was with him, I think, for six years. Oh, my. So um, I was just kind of trying to get myself out of that. So, uh, you know, the Olympics end uh, in Seoul, Korea, and then I come home to do some investigation. Um, What's that mean? Well, I, I wasn't allowed in the office because I'd screw everything up. So when he would go, then I would sneak into the office and I found where the keys were and, and did some digging. I only had $2,000 that was in my name. What? Everything else was in his name or held jointly. And so then- You were um, basically broke. Yeah. So then, uh, you know, then um, I went to a dear friend of mine, um, Debbie Sean, who's an attorney, and mm -hmm. she said, okay, we're gonna do this, this, and this, and this. And she was, at that time, on pretty good terms with you know with Jim, I said okay, we're this is what we're going to do, you know, and so we got everything transferred appropriately, mm -hmm. and um, and then and then I I eventually was able to break off the relationship myself. Yeah, and did yeah. he go nuts? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so, how how does one deal with that? 
Oh, lots of therapy. <laughs> I bet. I bet. So you break up this relationship. You've mm -hmm. just walked away with all these medals. Yeah. What was your game plan? Well, I didn't really have a game a game plan. Um, Were you getting offers to to do commercials or be on I, TV? I did a number of things. Um, I, I I got a a lot of scripts that you know. Oh, we wrote you in. And I'd read the script, and it was just... As Greg Louganis? Yeah, okay. and, and it was horrible because it wasn't me. Right. So at what point do you decide, uh, I'm no longer going to dive? Does your age uh, creep up and say, enough? Mm. Or, or what makes that decision for you? Well, uh, you know, being diagnosed six months prior to the Olympic Games, I thought I, I was done. I didn't think I would see 30. You really I, thought... I was, tw I was 28. Wow. And at that time... Yeah, there wasn't that a lot was of... That was pretty much it, yeah, two years. Yeah. You know, two years after you're diagnosed, you're, do, you're gone. And so... Were you in the frame of mind is, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm checking out? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know, the only thing that kept me really distracted was, you know, getting away from this abusive relationship and trying to get my footing. Hmm. So in the process of getting my footing, you know, I did Cinderella... I, you know, had a few other things that, that, that came up and happened. Um, I really got into the dog world. So I was breeding Harlequin Great Danes and I was showing and, uh, competing in obedience and all that. Um, and, you know, at, you know, once I, once I left Jim, um, I was seeing Steve Kometko and so Steve said, oh, I want a little Jack Russell that I can travel to the film festivals with. Because it was during the time of Frasier and Eddie. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, I'll do the training. So I did the training. And so, Jack Russell's can be nuts. Yeah, yeah. And she was. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a part Chihuahua, part Jack Russell, so yeah. I know what's going on. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And she became my superstar. I mean, she would. Really? She could. She competed in obedience. She went um, her CD, her uh, beginning novice title, uh, CD to UD, her most advanced obedience title in eight and a half months. I got a uh, a COVID dog. Yeah, we had had dogs in the past, um, and then there was this long gap, and my wife said, "I want another dog," and I thought, "Oh, yeah. it changes your life, and you can't go and do this." So, of course. We get this little dog that I didn't want. Mm -hmm. And the first day, he's sitting on the couch, you know, teeny little bundle of fur. And his name is Charlie. And I said, Charlie, do you want kisses? And so I would kiss him under his neck. And, mm -hmm. you know, now before he goes to bed, I got to kiss him under his neck. And not only do I kiss him here, but then he turns his head and wants yeah. me to kiss him on the other side. Right. And so they're just magical little beings. I was going through the IL-2 treatments, you know, which IL-2 was heavy duty. Mm. Um, and uh, it was like you you can't regulate your body temperature. It feels like the absolute worst flu that you've ever had. Um, and I was doing uh, these treatments once a month. So that was like, and it was a week. Of hell? Uh, yeah. And, and so... Um, eventually I, I, I said, I, I can't do this anymore. There's a thing, quality of life. I'd rather have the quality of life. But this was when I had my Great Danes. And so when I would go through the treatments, the Danes were a reason for me to get up, you know, to-, to Motivate you. Yeah, to get out. Um, they comforted me when I was not feeling well, when I was down for the count. And, um, you know, they were just really, uh, you know, my reason, you know, my reason to continue. It's a good thing that you had that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's easy to give up. Yeah. Um, yeah. when I first got diagnosed with cancer and they told me they had to do a needle in to take a, a bone marrow thing. And, and I right. walked out of the doctor's office and my wife said, where are you going? I said, I can't do cancer. Let's just go home and forget about this. Mm. And uh, eventually got talked back and went back. And yeah. But um, I'm not playing tit for tat here, but you know, going through chemotherapy is not the most fun in the world. I right. had it the first time for two years, several times since then. But yeah. um, you do have those mornings where you wake up and say, I, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, and that's, that's kind of, 
you know, I've been struggling with my energy. Mm. You know, and I even told my manager, said, you know what? I've climbed so many mountains. I'm just tired. Man, do I identify with what oh, you're saying. At God. some point you go, I, I, I'm exhausted. I yeah. can't do this anymore. Yeah. And I don't know what motivates you. I mean, the dogs motivate you. Yeah. Maybe you have a relationship that keeps you going. I've got grandkids. I've right uh, been married for a long time. But some days you just wake up and you just say, I, I can't do this anymore. Right. And I don't yeah. know, unless you've experienced that feeling, you know, everybody's always there. Oh, come on. It's all going to be fine. No, it's not. Yeah. Or not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. It's, or, it's, or, or even, do you even want it to? Well, that's the other thing. You know? Ah, oh, God. Yeah. I'm, uh, this little guy, yeah. G, my Hungarian Pumi, he is really talented. So my goal is to try to get him onto world team. Oh. You know, and um, so. A lot of work. Yeah. So that's what's keeping me going right now. You know, because I'm struggling, you know, with the finance and all that stuff. You well, know, let's I, talk I didn't about expect that. to be here. Endorsement really wise. Did. Yeah. Does that exist? Well, you know what? I I stepped away from Red Bull Cliff Diving World Series um, because I just didn't feel it was in alignment with what I wanted to stand for. You know, health and wellness. You know, Red Bull is not exactly a health drink. No. Um, and so... Uh, it's about choices. So I, I, I stepped away from it just for integrity. You know, thinking, oh, well, this will open up. You know, and everybody was saying, oh, one door closes, another door opens. Not like, necessarily. Not necessarily. I'm waiting for the door. Well, so, let me ask you about that. Um, did you ever do broadcasting on Wide World of Sports during the Olympics? Funny you should ask that. Um, I, I was up for, um, in 1990, they were looking at me. Uh, to uh, help out on the commentating. Mm -hmm. um, Cynthia Potter married the, uh, the executive director of NBC Sports. So that was a job. Was Olmeyer the... Uh, this no, 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 um, for diving. Oh, for, for diving, diving. Okay. yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, um, Peter Diamond. And so, uh, you know, that, she, she got that job. <laughs> But they were looking for somebody else. Uh -huh. And this was in 1990. And Not too many years after you've just accomplished all these amazing yeah, things. Yeah, two gold medals. Um, and so then uh, I was up against this other person. And the other person was very good friends with Jim. Mm. And Show business. She let, she let the producers and director know about my HIV status. So in 1990, I understand I would have been a liability. Everybody was freaking out. At that time, everyone was freaking out, yeah. and I would have been a liability. So, wow. and I, even I understand, you know, yeah. that. Um, but, you know, I, I just let it go. I just let it go. I didn't, I didn't want to dwell on what I don't have. There's one area I want to talk about because apparently you, uh, in a younger age, uh, started to smoke and drink and, and yeah. do things that people that age don't normally do. How did you back into that? What caused that? Well, I grew up in a home. Um, you know, alcohol uh, was very prevalent. Both, uh -huh. both my parents smoked. And so, you know, those, those were my role models. And also, <clears throat> when I, <laughs> I, I snuck a couple bottles of wine out of the house on a Halloween. <laughs> and I think I was 13, 12, 12, probably 12. Um, God, a lot of things happened when I was 12, didn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, but one hell of a lot. Yeah, huh? so, yeah, it's like, wow, when I was 12, I did a lot of shit. <laughs> um, but um, I, 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 I snuck the bottles of wine. Nobody, everybody was afraid to drink it. So I ended up drinking all of it. Oh, my. And I got so drunk. I, I came home stumbling. You know, was, Greg, where's your candy? I was oh, I don't know. I, just, uh, I didn't know <laughs> I where my candy it. was. What, you know, it was crazy. And then I got sick. Oh. And um, and my punishment was go to school the next day because we had it was a school night. Right. Oh my. I was like that was my punishment, and that was it. Oh, and okay. then after that. It was, well, if you're going to drink, you have to learn how to drink. Yeah. You know, so we could drink, drink in, the, in the house. Yes. And, you know, uh, 
You're never allowed to get drunk. So that's the household I grew up in. You are not getting the appreciation that I feel you deserve yeah. for what you've accomplished. Do you feel the same way? Um, yeah, but I also see that a lot of it is my own doing. Really? Yeah, not fighting for standing up for myself. Right. You know? But it's never too late. It's never too late. Yeah. I mean, the things you've accomplished... Well, I started... I started it's interesting because um, <clears throat> what happened... You know, just, I think it was last week, um, <clears throat> a friend of mine teaches yoga and he's in Austin, Texas and live stream and who happens to be in his class, but be wicked who, it, who's a break dancer mm -hmm. and he's managing the Olympic team for break dancing. Oh, U that's US. right. I forgot that. An and event. so <clears throat> he said, oh my God. Yeah. It was, and he was talking about the Olympics and we were quiet, we were quiet, we were quiet. And then. Um, he didn't realize that he was in the class with Ted mm -hmm. and he was all excited about the Olympics, the, talking about the Olympics and I'm, uh, on zoom listening in. It's like, um, Hey Ted, <laughs> tell Wicket that if he needs any help, reach out, yeah. you know? And so that got me thinking and I, I started writing just this weekend, um, directions to the podium. Because like when, when Steve had me in to work with the athletes in preparation for London and Rio, mm -hmm. um, I, my first question to the athletes was, what's your ultimate diving goal? They said, make the Olympic team. I said, and then what? And they just look at me like, make the Olympic team. They hadn't thought past that. You know, that's the reason why in, in 2000, Diving is a, is a sport that U.S. has always been pretty dominant. Yeah. So in 2000, we got one medal. Laura Wilkinson, gold. 2004, we add synchronized diving, so they have four more shots at medals. And? Zero medals in 04. Huh. Zero medals in 08. And then after working with the kids, you know, and I don't claim all of the credit, but um, I, I do need to stand up for it and for, for myself and say, look, we got four medals in, in London. We got three medals in Rio when we were getting zero. So what's your relationship with the Olympic Committee these days? Well, that's USA Diving. Okay. Um, Olympic Committee... Um, they kind of farm everything out to the national governing bodies. You know, they, you know, kind of let they, um, the things that they do are more organization like, okay, so Janet Evans, she's, you know, rocking it out, you know, getting, getting ready for 2028, mm -hmm. you know, getting people, volunteers and, and, you know, the excitement around that. Um, my relationship with the USOC is U USOPA, um, it's good, you know, I, I, I did serve on the board for uh, a short window of time. Um, it just felt, for me, po politics is not exactly my thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was a lot of, a lot of that. And the diving team? Diving, I don't know that I have a relationship with them. Because? They've reached out and said, oh, we need, you know, we want you, want to get you back involved. I said, you know, and they've done that numerous times and then nothing. I hear from them and say, oh, we want to do something. Never have any type of proposal or anything. What would be the ultimate job you would like to do right now? Well, okay. I was thinking about that, you know, and I, I was actually going to, uh, you know, in, in the process of putting it on my um, LinkedIn page is uh, offer to, uh, you know, to work with national governing bodies and say, you know, these are the directions to the podium. You know, this podium placements happen in practice. They don't happen on the day. I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, if you're not training in your training, 
training as if you are at the Olympic Games, you're not going to be ready. Makes sense, but yeah. I just never thought about that. Well, I broke 700 in practice before I ever did it on the world stage. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's... it's uh, um, it's a process. It's, it's a you know, process. It, it I mean, it just doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. That, yeah, I, I mean, know. it's like what. Um, oh shoot, what, uh, Jerry, Jerry um, Mitchell, I think, uh, choreographer. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what he always says: is, is play full out, dance full out. Yeah. You know, and and it is. You have to practice full out. Otherwise, there's no point in doing it. There's no point in doing it. And also, you're not going to be prepared. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. You can't all of a sudden turn it on that one day. Right. You, you've got to be at peak position every time you go out there. And also, what, huh. what I work, you know, because I t also teach visualization, is that I encourage uh, the people that I work with, don't visualize perfect. And people miss that. Yeah. Because oftentimes we make subtle little mistakes and right. errors, which are habit. And so chances are we're going to repeat that habit under a stressful condition. So we need to prepare for that. So if you're ready for it, then you can make the adjustment necessary instead of ah, panicking. Because if you think about it, a dive takes less than three seconds. I know. A dive takes less than three seconds. And the in preparation. That, and in that three seconds is your creation. Yeah. Because there's no wires, there's no mirrors, there's that's it. And it's chaos. It is chaos. Because all you're doing is falling. When you're I saw you do one dive where you were doing a handstand yeah yeah and then you know when you're standing like that and you you're up there five seven nine seconds something you're mm -hmm. up there seemed like a hell of a long time well you have is to your mind you going have to crazy show you have to show control yes so um uh is your mind going crazy are you um, thinking too much about what's about to happen the most important thing is shutting off your mind really yeah just do what you your have to instincts... allow your body to do what it's about to do you in practice you have done that dive yeah, a thousand times a thousand times on all these different types of takes off takeoffs and you have to be uh sensitive enough to feel what is appropriate in order to be as successful as you pot possibly can be on that particular moment you know, because like I said, I mean, okay, so less than three seconds, you know, so in uh, in a single competition, like a, an Olympic Games, since we had prelims, finals, prelims, finals, uh, three meter springboard, 10 meter platform, I had 42 opportunities to practice mm -hmm. peak performance. Mm -hmm. Each one of those dives is a new creation. You can't repeat you, there's no repeating anything. You can't cross the same river twice. <laughs> you know? Never thought about it that way, but... So, you know, you... That's your creation. If you're stuck in what you did in the past, oh, I did this dive there, here, there, 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 you know. No. Or another mistake a lot of uh, athletes make, I can see it when, you know, when they're competing. They're trying to control the environment. Can't and you can't control the environment. No. You have to embrace the environment. You have to be allow that to be a part of the experience. And also peak performance, you can experience in so many different ways where you know everything sound, feels like in slow motion and you're in so much control. Other times, you know, you take off the board and you're in the water and you're wondering what the hell happened. Um, your focus can be different. Like, uh, you know, at world championships, I was aware of every little rivet on the board and the, the, the surface of the water, the, you know, how the spray was hitting it. I was so aware, acutely aware, narrow focus. The only thing that existed was me and my coach. Everybody, everything else was in a blur. 1984 Olympic games, 
Um, I'm aware of Tom Bray, you know, Bradley coming in to, in, into the uh, stadium late. You know, it was like, we already did one dive, I think. I said, hey, Tom, you're late. He said, yeah, Greg, I'm trying to find my seat. That was the experience. I was aware, my, my, my awareness was so expanded. I mean, I was aware of the lady in the flowered hat in the fifth row, you know, three se- seats over. And was, I mean, I was aware. I was aware of where my mom was. I was aware of where my dad was. They were going through a divorce. So they, so they were be, not sitting they together. Were, they were not oh sitting my. together. And it's like, what was okay. their reaction when you were doing all this? My mom, all she wanted for me was to, is to have fun. Mm-hmm. You know, she just, that's all she was concerned about. Your dad? This was my feeling. This is what I did to myself was I had to win in order to be worthy of his love. Oh my. So a lot of pressure. Was, yeah. So that was, uh, yeah. So but when it, you it, won, it did, it, it did evolve because, yeah. you know, you don't hold on to those things for 10 years, you know, and I, well, and I dominated do. the sport for 10 years. So no, but you've got to evolve you in order to. to be successful in order for me to have as much success. I had to evolve. What year did you meet your birth parents? Ooh, um, so uh, I, I met my biological father. It was after the '84 Olympic Games, and uh, and I was in uh, Hawaii, and I was doing a, an appearance for Speedo. Uh, I was with uh, with with Speedo <laughs> at the time, and my host says, "Greg, your father's here." I said, what? My father would have told me if he was coming to Hawaii. I said, no, 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 your biological father, and he wants to meet you. You had no idea. And I was like, oh, okay. And so he asked if I, if I wanted to meet him. I said, yeah, sure. And so I met him, and it was so emotional for him. I mean, he was crying. He was apologizing. He was you know, so, uh, you know, distraught, you know, Hmm. I, you know, it was like, wow, you know, um, and I wasn't sure because like the age that he gave me, I said, how old are you? Um, because what I was told is both my parents were 16 when I was born. Not the case. And yeah, he would have been older. Mm. Uh, he would have been like 20. And so I was like, well, that's not jiving. And what I was reminded later was that in 1960, you know, they lied about that for statutory rape yep. and all of that stuff um, because my mother was 16. Did you keep a relationship after that? Yeah. Nice. And um, Fuvali, Fuvali Lutu. Uh, I have a half brother and two half sisters. So Malcolm and Sherilyn and Geraldine. Um, Where do they live? In Hawaii. They do. Yeah. And I, oh God, I adore them so much. Um, so we were doing a, a screening of Back on Board in Hawaii. And I was telling my now ex husband, Johnny, I said, Don't be surprised if my father shows up. He said, Greg, your father's been dead for ages. <laughs> I said, No, no, no. My biological father said, Oh. And so then he showed up and, um, and he goes, oh my God, that is that is your father. Really? Yeah, yeah. And and I heard that there was going to be a Lutu family reunion the following year. And so I reached out to my brother Malcolm and I said, Malcolm, do you think it'd be okay if I came to the reunion? Would it be okay? <laughs> Are you kidding said, me? Oh, and they said, Oh my God, Greg, if you t- can talk, if you talk about us, we can talk about you and we can share. And said, oh my God, yes, yes. Did it happen? And so it did happen. Um, but what I wanted to make sure that he was in fact my father biological father so i did ancestry.com dna and and uh found out that he was in fact my dad nice but i also got a message from somebody who said look i know who you are and you came up as a leaf on our family tree and the only thing we can think of is that you might be my aunt's son your your mom yeah and so she had a conversation with her aunt and um she said, okay, and, and she said, well, if you were conceived in Midway, born in San Diego, and your father's name is Fuvali Lutu, <laughs> she's my mom. So I did find my mom. And what was that and, like? Well, we did connect. Um, I, I, I did want to meet my dad. You know, I always wanted to meet my dad. 
that was always, you know, something. Uh, and, and my mother knew that. And I knew that my mother was hesitant about me meeting my mom. Really? Because my mom was concerned that she'd be too needy. Oh. And so, um, <laughs> and she was right. Uh, <laughs> but I did meet her. And it just so happened uh, we met, uh, I met him at a Thanksgiving, uh, went, went there. Um, I think we went to Northern California. Uh, and, and, and met, and then it just so happened that my niece was getting married early the next year. And then my half brother was getting married in September and they asked me to go and I, I agreed to. So, um, so I went to my niece's wedding and I went to my half brother's wedding. Um, but that's not typical for me. No, huh? That's not that's not typical for me in my family. That's not how I grew up. I mean, I I could I could go because of the diving and all of those, um, you know, um, responsibilities of travel and all that stuff. I didn't make it to a lot of holidays because uh, we may have had a training camp. You were focused and all that. on was, what you were doing. Yeah, I was focused. So five years would go by and I wouldn't see my cousin. And that was normal. Mm -hmm. But to see my mother three times in less than a year. It was unusual. That's highly unusual. But I, I think her interpretation of it was, I mean, she was trying to call every day. Oh. And it was- it Making was, up for lost time. Yeah, it was just Stressful. too much. Yeah. yeah. Conceived in Midway, I think it was more all the way, don't you? <laughs> well, yeah, okay. It, you know, it's not a real romantic story. <laughs> no, it doesn't sound but, like it. Um, so my, my dad was on the boxing team. He was- he, he, So he was an athlete. Well, yeah, he was an Well, my brother was third in the world, strong man. Come on. Yeah. So it's Malcolm? in the genes there. Oh my God. I, I, I saw videos of him, you know, pulling a truck across oh a baseball, uh, football field. And I mean, some crazy, crazy stuff. You know, he was just unbelievable. When you made it to the Wheaties box, what'd you think? That was always like the big oh, thing. Oh, that was, yeah, you know, Julie Sondroth, um, she, you know, after back on board, I didn't realize what a big deal the Wheaties box oh, was. I I really didn't. And then when we were doing Back on Board, Cheryl Forgenic, we were at the uh, International Swimming Hall of Fame, and they had all of these swimmers, a lot of them obscure, you know, uh, Wheaties boxes. I'm like, oh my God, you know, that's what everybody's talking about. Oh, yeah. Is that, and I never had a Wheaties box. And so um, Julie, uh, did this whole campaign thing and it just took off. And I'm sure that's the reason why, you know, Pretty general, cool, general meals. And that was, and, and, and I was so grateful too, because I felt in a sense, it was more important now because they're recognizing and embracing a whole person. Oh yeah. You know, as opposed I'm gay, HIV positive, all of these, rather than just celebrating an athlete. How's your health today? Health today is okay. I mean, okay, the <laughs> HIV thing is yeah. stable. Stable. Um, uh, yeah, the a HIV is fine. Um, you know, I'm I'm still contemplating what you know what the heck's going on. I think I have some brain stuff going on. Um, so I, you know, I I was watching this interview with Dr. Daniel Amen, mm -hmm. and he said that concussions could be accumulative. Um, it was, he was doing, uh, Mark Hyman was doing the interview and, and I had never heard that, that concussions could be accumulative. That's interesting. Yeah. So anyways, I, I was very curious because I was super, super depressed mm. at the, uh, onset of the, uh, pandemic, you know, quarantine and everything. Uh, I, but I knew it was something more, there was something more to it. And so, um, scraped the money together to, to get a, a spec scan and they found damage consistent with blunt force trauma. Really? Yeah, because I, I hit my head in 79, um, I was 19. I was in Tbilisi, Russia, in the uh, province of Georgia. I hit my head on the platform. Mm. And I was- No give there. I was out for 20 minutes. Oh my. They said. And so I don't remember it. Mm. All I remember is jumping up in the air, touching my toes on a reverse dive pike and thinking, God, what a beautiful day. 
That's all you remember. That's it. Wow. That's all I remember. Uh, what does the word no mean to you? <laughs> the word no. Mm-hmm. The, oh, gosh. It depends on what context, because no could also mean maybe. Okay. That's, <laughs> but that's positive. See, to me, I talk no. about this in my show about uh, I never accept the word no. And yeah. to me, no is just another word for not yet. Okay. Okay. So okay. I'm, I'm going to play uh, analyst here, and I have a no degree, and I'm not a doctor, and I don't play one on TV. Okay. But <clears throat> a few minutes ago, you gave a tutorial on, you did, on attitude and what you have to think uh, as you're going up there diving and the positivity that one needs. Mm. I don't know if you knew you were doing it or not, but yeah. I soaked it all in. And see, to me, that's valuable, that yeah. just being in the presence of... Uh, of the U.S. diving team and teaching them these elements mm. would be amazing. Yeah. And so I guess my question to you is, and you can say, you don't have to answer anything uh, that you don't want to. Do you feel at times you've given up too easily for goals that you wanted to attain? Um, or do you think you've given in 110%? Because you gave 150% when you were diving mm-hmm. and obviously when you're performing. But mm-hmm. the little thing that's seeping through to me, and don't take this the wrong way because I am a huge fan of yours, yeah. is that there are things that you want to accomplish, but you're hesitant because you're afraid to hear the word no. Um, okay, I, I understand, I think, what you're saying. Um, you have so much to offer. I, I, I think it's more of a self-esteem thing. okay. I'll accept for, that. For me. Yeah. For me. So how do you overcome that, that? And that's what I'm working on. Oh my God, I've got like, um, I, I, I just uh, been doing this meditation or hypnosis uh-huh. for confidence. Uh-huh. Um, and also uh, I've been working with Dr. Steve Small. He does uh, quantum healing, you know, energy. And so um, he gave me this device to kind of track and uh, you know where I'm at, and what I'm finding that uh, a, a lot of stuff that kind of um, you know you have uh, generational trauma, you know, kind of stuff, mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, and and, and a, another big underlying thing is self esteem. Always. So that that and, and that's 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 what I struggle but, with. But but think about this: what you accomplished, I know, in your isn't 20s it, it, uh, is insane. Yeah. I mean, it I is. mean, it's crazy. It is. And it's now, crazy. How old are you? Sixty. Sixty-three. Sixty-three. Okay. So at sixty-three, you've done things that most humans couldn't even think of accomplishing. Did, did you see um, the weight of gold? No, I did not. Uh, on HBO, uh, Michael Phelps, David Budaya. Um, anyways, David said that he was warned about the post-Olympic blues. Did you have them? Yeah. You did? Well, I was warned about the post-Olympic blues by Pat McCormick in 1976. Saying that you're at this high, high, and then it's mm-hmm. all going to go away, and how do you deal with that? Yeah. I was the one who told David- Ah. Oh. Beware. But uh, about the post-Olympic blues. Interestingly enough, he couldn't name my name. And you, you talked about homophobia. Yeah. I don't think anybody cares. I know. No, but there's certain I don't, associations. I, I don't think so anymore. I think you're putting too much emphasis on that. No, 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 no. no. Really? This, this, one, this one I know. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. In 2023, yeah. people give a shit if you're gay. Yeah. He, he, uh, his coach wanted to pray the gay away. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Ah, uh, I don't yeah. even know what to say. Yeah. I, it's just frightening to me that that still exists. Yeah, yeah. Oh uh, my god, my god, my god! It's yeah. insane. You know, and you know, it, you know, and it's crazy. It, you know, but I, but I also understand too that it's more of a reflection of them, not me. Yeah, of course, hundred you know? percent. Yeah, it's their ignorance. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, been unwrapping Greg Luganus. It's been a fabulous conversation. We'll see you next week. Take care. So, I signed off, but now we're back because. You just revealed something to me that through all my research, and I do pretty good research, I didn't know, um, that at one point you wanted to take your life. Explain the story. Well, uh, I, I did mention it in you know um, the post-Olympic blues, 76, my first Olympic Games, and I was a silver medalist. That mm-hmm. The highest suicide rate is amongst silver medalists, and I was, I was amongst one of them. 
you know, that, um, but anyways, um, in 1976, I was being coached by Dr. Sammy Lee and Dr. Sammy Lee won two Olympic gold medals in men's platform, 48 and 52. He coached Bobby Webster, uh, to win two gold medals in men's platform, 60, 64. And then Klaus DiBiase from Italy was going for his third Olympic gold medal in 1976. So my sole purpose on this planet was to prevent Klaus from winning that gold medal. And I failed. And so because in your mind you failed, did, did your right. coach tell you you failed as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. He made it very clear. That you screwed up. Yeah. And now you say that because of that so-called screw-up, Mm -hmm. You wanted to take your life. Yeah, because I was only 16. I was yeah. so confused. I, I felt like a failure. I come home and everybody's celebrating me. And it was so confusing to me. Hmm. And I felt so worthless. And I felt like the world would be a better place without me. So did you make an attempt? Oh, yeah. What'd yeah. you do? Um, I took pills. I raided my mom's uh, uh, medicine cabinet because she had some surgeries and and stuff, and she had some you know pills in there. Um, Did you write a note? Yeah. Did somebody discover you obviously and said what's going on, and they pumped your stomach? I'm assuming. No, no. What happened? I, probably the combination of drugs that I took kind of offset each other. So um, yeah, I woke up the next day. Uh, really kind of hung over and, and stuff. Um, and, uh, and I had to go to diving workout. So I drove to, to dive workout. Uh, and I was, I was so wobbly. I was so, you know, um, I just told Dr. Lee that I was, I wasn't feeling well. Was he not aware of what had happened? He wasn't. And then, uh, and then I think I called my mom and she asked me if I took the medi medi medicine from her cabinet, and I said, yeah, and I started crying. Mm. So she knew that I took took the meds. Um, you know, and that was back in the day. You don't you don't go to psychiatrists. You're not crazy. You're you know uh, you know no, buck, you, buck up. You know you you know get over it. And, you know all it of was that always stuff. get over it. Yeah, yeah, right. Back then, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, people thought you were really crazy yeah. if you even thought about doing that. Right. So it was get over it and move on. And yeah. so it seems to me that maybe you didn't. I didn't. So th that yeah. still affects you to this day. Well, I'm. Um... I mean, you can't look at yourself as a failure. Based on that. Oh, oh, well, okay. So that medal, yes. silver medal, it was decades right. before I could hold that medal with pride. Really? And, but I, I am so proud that I was able to accomplish that yeah. at such a young age. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I can see and appreciate it now. I couldn't then. Recently, didn't you decide to sell your medals? Yeah, yeah. I put them up for auction. They didn't go, though. They did not? No, no. I mean, they're, they're you know, uh, if, 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 if we got a high enough bid, then they would go. But, yeah, no, we didn't. What were you trying to raise money it. for? Um, the Damien Center. Which is? Well, for myself. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, need, I need the money. Right. But, but also 10%, you know, is going to go to the Damien Center, um, which just broke ground in March. Uh, because they were bursting at the seams. Uh, their uh, um, HIV AIDS service provider in Indianapolis. And they provide all kinds of services from you know housing, medical, uh, dental. They have a food bank that you know they, they offer. It's it's a one stop shop. And what I my goal was to uh, raise enough money to be able to donate the money to have the Welcome Center um, uh, named for Ryan White, oh. and then uh, I also wanted to hopefully raise enough money for the 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 lounge uh to be named for my mom Francis, oh. Francis Luganus. How sweet. So that was what my goal was. We didn't we didn't reach it, but um we're we're trying to devise experiences with me so that we can auction off to to raise money for the Damien Center. Last question, what was the last time you were on a platform diving? 
Um, it, it actually wasn't all that long ago. Um, cause I remember I, I was in, um, um, uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, um, Matthew Mitchum was being honored. And so we went to the pool at, um, in, in Fort Lauderdale at the International Swimming Hall of Fame and they have a 27 meter platform. They just built a 27 meter platform. Freaking huge. Yeah. I mean, we didn't go up to the 27 meter, but they allowed us to go off of the 15 meter. And did you? And we did. Oh my. So, cause you know, he, he's not a, you know, high diver either. Right. And so he said, okay, let's do it together. You know, and, so, and then we count one, two, three, and we jumped off of the 15 meter platform. Good God. Yeah. Was it fun? It was a blast. I mean, and, and the thing is, you know, to do to do those kinds of things with someone sharing those experiences, you know, that, that's just really, really special. Pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. I, I've learned a lot from you. Um, I admire you even more after this conversation. Uh, oh. Before, I was amazing, but uh, oh. we're going to work on doing something to get you to that next level, okay. I'm telling yeah, you, yeah, yeah. because you deserve it. Thanks again. Be well. Mark Summers Unwraps is a production of Believe Limited, created by me, Mark Summers, and Jessica Richmond. Produced by Keith Corneluk and Jessica Richmond. Executive produced by Patrick James Lynch and Ryan Geelan. Post-production support from Joshua Sterling Bragg and Believe Limited. Don't forget to subscribe or follow the show on your favorite podcast player, and if you really love it, why don't you leave us a rating and a review? Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on... Mark Summers on Raps. <laughs>